Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. Good afternoon to everyone. I am so very humbled and thankful for the opportunity to be here and to share uh, with you today. Uh, when asked about the uh, subject of uh, my conversation with you today, uh, most people who know me well were absolutely stunned that the word data would occur <laughs> in anything that I talk about. Uh, but but I, I, I will hopefully share a different perspective on how we understand inner city communities here in Baton Rouge and the opportunity that is before us. Uh, sometimes life proves to be very interesting. And I asked one of the members of the team at Metro Morphosis, and I'm thankful for those who are here sharing with me today, I asked one of the members of the team to help me uh, put together the slides for the presentation, the images that we would use, and we talked about them. What we did not talk about is what would be the slide that would be on the opening. And here is the interesting point. Uh, the image there is at the intersection of Bogan Walk and Acadian Thruway. The lion there, uh, and beneath Bogan Walk, it says the home of the lions, is a reference to Capitol High School. I am a 1974 graduate of Capitol High School. And for my four years of attending Capitol High School, I walked Bogan Walk every day going to school. And so when I asked to put together a deck of slides, how interesting is it that this person who knows very little about that stage of my life would end up with a slide that is so connected with my life experiences? I would also share with you that that is noteworthy because the perspective that I share with you as it relates to inner city Baton Rouge is not one that I've read about, but rather it is my lived experience. It is the motivation for what I do. It is the source of both my passion and the perspective that I bring to this work. And so those three words that I'd like to ask you to be mindful of as we share in this time together, uh, again, data, dashboards, and determination. Uh, I believe that as a community, we are at a pivotal moment. And what happens now matters and will matter for generations to come. There are multiple moving pieces that are currently at play in our community. Uh, the Move BR, the Mayor's uh, Roads Initiative and its impact. The whole question of St. George and uh, respecting the opinions and values of some members of our community while understanding it in a much larger context. The question of uh, ITIP and how that plays out and how is it, it impacts people and institutions who have been a part of this community for generations low performing schools and efforts to begin to change the trajectory of the performance of the students who attend there. There's industrial and commercial uh, expansion happening all around our community. There are few days that we don't have conversations about crime and this whole notion of 21st century policing and what it looks like in our community. And there are those who would tap us on the shoulder and remind us that the summer is coming and that there's always some correlation between summer and crime in our community. We are beset by competing narratives. There are those who would say that Baton Rouge is becoming an emerging progressive community. And then there are others who would passionately disagree and describe us in less flattering terms. 
things such as uh, bastions of oppression and racism and the good old boys network and one that old money controls and things that are not quite as flattering in describing our community. On one hand, there are those who extol the growth and opportunity that is emerging in our community, while there are others who would point to the crime and blight, and dare I say the traffic that <laughs> so defines our community. What I would stand before you today and argue, what I would posit, what I would put forth is that what is most important in this pivotal moment is a platform that would allow reasonable minds to deliberate and to co-create ideas that make our community a better place to live. And just out of, out of my sense of curiosity, I Googled isn't it interesting how that has become a part of our lexicon? The word platform. And it was described as a surface, a level surface that was above, that allowed people and things to stand on it. And what I would suggest to you is that in this moment and in this season, what we need most is something that is above all of those things that hinder us from finding reasonable spaces to talk about things that we may have disagreements about and spend time focused on those things that we do, creating a space where we can co-create a path forward for this community. And I believe that data non-biased, void of an agenda, mutually acceptable expressions, and things that are focused on things that really matter, can afford us an opportunity to have a shared conversation about who we are where we're headed, and are we actually getting there? And that there are numbers, there are indicators that speak truth and are devoid of our lived experiences and our biases such as they are. And so this whole uh, data thing affords us a tremendous opportunity in this season. Now, doubtlessly, almost all of you in the room uh, ha have made the connection between data and these two very attractive people in swimwear. <laughs> but for the few who have not, It harkens back to my days in the Louisiana House of Representatives where data had not yet become a common term and we still talked about statistics. And one of the comments that I would make whenever anyone would sit at a table or stand on the floor of the House of Representatives and spout statistics I would say to them that statistics are like swimwear. What they reveal is interesting. <laughs> what they cover up is vital. <laughs> And so as a consequence, we have to be careful in how we engage with data. Because so very often, people will spout numbers at us to assert that they mean certain things, and what they reveal is interesting. 
But so very often, it's what they cover up that's vital. And so I would argue that when we talk about data, it's important that it is disaggregated for those who live in the world of numbers and for those uh, who are in the political arena. We need to look at the cross tabs. We need to look beyond the big picture because truthfully, when we start talking numbers, the devil is in the details. And so for example, a statistic would say to us that the graduation rate for minorities in East Baton Rouge Parish public schools is 56%. Now that number will evoke for us a number of different responses because the revelation that only 56% of minorities are graduating in a timely fashion means different things to all of us. But what I would suggest to you is that that 56% is revealing, but what it covers up is vital. Because when you realize that the term minority includes not only African American males and females, Hispanic males and females, those who are of oriental descent, male and female, and others there, then disaggregating that data and pulling one small piece, for example, the graduation rate of black boys, would be a far more telling number to example, to examine, than even that troubling 56%. And so I would suggest to you that for those who are passionate about making Baton Rouge a better place to live, a good place to start would be agreeing upon a set of disaggregated bits of information that share vital things about our community. And for those of you who would agree that finding that space to share with one another would be valuable, there are some areas that I would suggest to you would be good places for us to start. The first is this notion of opportunity. The screenshot that you see is from a website uh, called the Opportunity Index. And they've gone into all 50 states and by county or by parish, and looked at education, the economy, edu uh, community, a sense of community, uh, and health with a set of indicators, and they've assigned an opportunity score to states and communities. Unfortunately, in the top right corner above the C, you see the number 50 across from Louisiana. And what it says is that according to the indicators of the Opportunity Index, Louisiana ranked 50th in terms of opportunities. And that the city of Baton Rouge, or the parish of East Baton Rouge, scored a 42.4 out of a possible 100. But may I take those numbers and delve a little deeper with you because while that's revealing, I'd like to share some things with you that I believe are vital. And we can file them under the general heading of in Baton Rouge when it comes to opportunity, geography matters. If, for example, you lived in 70808 and the question was bachelor's degree or higher, 51.6% of individuals who live in 70808 have a bachelor's degree or higher. If, by chance, you were born in 70805, that number is 7.2%. If you lived in 70808, and the question was household income, the average would be 61,807. But if by chance 
You were born in 70805. That number is $25,783. If the question were children, it's because we all certainly want our children to have opportunity. Well, if your child were born in 70808, the number of children impacted by poverty is less than 10%. But children in 70805, 64% of them live beneath poverty standards. I would suggest that for those who genuinely care about the well being of our community, those might be some numbers we'd want to pay attention to. And we might want to agree upon a source with which we would not argue, that we would not assign agenda, that would be nonpartisan. But wouldn't it be interested if a group of people who had an interest in making things better could agree upon some of those? And so opportunity is a great place to start. Another would be African-American males. I will make a declaration to you. I am firmly convinced of this. And it is that community progress for the city of Baton Rouge is an absolute impossibility without addressing the narratives and experiences of black boys and men. Because it does not matter which of the indicators you look at the numbers that are associated with African-American boys and African-American men in this community stand out. They are outliers. That graduation rate that I alluded to earlier, the income number, the educational attainment, the health and well-being, it does not matter the category that you look at. The experiences of black boys and men in our community are different. And it is important that you hear me make that statement without any sense of accusing anyone of anything. It's what the numbers reveal. And we spend so much time arguing about who, what, that we rarely ever get around to why and what's beneath these numbers, and what are the things that might begin to change them. We have a tremendous opportunity to change the overall well-being of our community by simply being intentional in addressing some of the outcomes being experienced by black boys and men in our community. A vast reservoir of resources, financial and otherwise, would be able to be repurposed if we were not spending them in remediating and punitive actions as they relate to boys and men of color in our community. We would have so many uh, additional dollars to put in the classroom if we were not suspending 18,000 black boys a year. Less than 20,000 suspensions and expulsions. More than 18,000 of them were African American boys. 90% of the students in the alternative schools African-American boys. What would happen if we changed the trajectory of those lives and did not have to spend that money doing that with an, oh, by the way, absolutely abysmal return on the investment? 
What would be the down the line implications of that work in terms of incarceration and the complex around maintaining people that we've built? Opportunity, African American males, and then this notion of anchors and assets. We, as a community, need to understand what really makes a difference in our community. Who are those actors that have catalytic impact? And we need to understand that from the perspective of businesses. I would suggest to you, for example, that Tony's Seafood is a catalytic actor in North Baton Rouge. Who are the others? Where are the others? How do we quantify? How do we distinguish them? How do we understand who they are? How do we understand who their feeder entities might be? Or their supplier chains might be? So that we can begin to intelligently capitalize on the entrepreneurial spirit that is so present in many of the distressed communities, but is oft times not connected with that which is a strong anchor already. And so what would happen if we began to understand who the anchors are in terms of businesses, but not only businesses, but organizations? I'm so thankful to see my dear friend Fred Sibley here and uh, after his recent stint uh, as the president of 100 Black Men. 100 Black Men is located on the corner of Foster Drive and Fairfield, right across the street from the Triple S store. And I was absolutely amazed at how many camera shots and interviews were done in front of Triple S store and nobody ever panned the camera to show 100 Black Men. So what happens when we begin to understand who's already there? You see, unfortunately, far too often when we have conversations about certain parts of our communities or certain demographics in our communities, we begin with a deficit-based narrative. Here's what's wrong. Rather than understanding what's there, what can we build upon? What can we connect? Who are some anchors and assets that are in place? Institutions. At the bottom there is the Living Faith Christian Center. Bishop Raymond Johnson, a very dear friend of mine, uh, is, 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 is the pastor there. I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the impact of living faith on the community around it has a wide expanse to it. And that there are other institutional actors in that community and in other communities that if we were to begin to understand, if we were to begin to map, if we were to begin to, to, to understand their impact in empirical terms, that we could weave together something that begins to change the very fabric of this community. And before I leave this, I would highlight that one of our great assets that is consistently overlooked are seniors. People like me with lots of gray hair. For the longest, I thought that my wife was painting it while I was asleep at night. <laughs> In the United States of America, 10,000 people turn 65 every day. 10,000 people every day turn 65. That's true in distressed communities where seniors report feeling increasingly isolated, separated, marginalized, and devalued. 
And the irony is, is that at the same time, we are having so many of the issues with young people and family composition and need for volunteers that we are having this huge growth in the population of people who are over 65, but we've not thought intentionally about what a framework to connect them might just look like. I would suggest that one of the most valuable assets that we have in our communities are wasting their very valuable gifts doing stuff like bingo and macrame when they could be changing lives and strengthening families. But we must understand who they are, where they are. What are their gifts, talents, and abilities? What are the needs that are present? The last area that I would share with you that we need to really pay attention to the numbers is education. 42,000 children and families thereabout are impacted by the East Baton Rouge Parish School System. There are many others, many others, many others who are impacted by schools that have been recruited by New Schools Baton Rouge and others that have been chartered by the state. If we would impact but six indicators associated with K through 12 education in our community, the impact would be unbelievable in terms of workforce, in terms of families, in terms of crime, violence, so many others. We are at a pivotal moment. And I believe that disaggregated data and a mutually agreed upon dashboard would be critical first steps. But they would both mean absolutely nothing if there's not a determination to make this community better. And I believe that there are many people who are interested in making Baton Rouge its best self. What we need to do in this pivotal moment is get beyond the white noise, reject the echo chambers on either end of the spectrum, and find a place where we can agree that the most important thing we can do is work together to make this place better for those who will come behind us. Thank you, and God bless you for your time. If there are any questions, um, Raymond will take some. How you doing, doctor? Well, I, I, uh, I, I, I signed a, uh, an agreement uh, that I would not make an ask for anything in order to stand before this mic, and so I would dare not violate that. What I would share with you is that uh, many of the institutions and efforts that are critical to making a difference are unfortunately hiding in plain sight. And if we just took the time to do a bit of investigating, uh, we, we, we would begin to discover things that are happening across our community that if they were properly supported, the impact would be exponential. 
Yes. How is your is it metamorphosis? Yeah, metamorphosis. How is that going with the young man? Well, and, and I, I, I am not being coy at all in my answers, uh, but part of the commitment that I made to, to share here is that this would be about our community and broader issues and would not in any way be a pitch for, for metromorphosis. But I would just share with you that the Urban Congress on African American Males uh, is uh, on this Saturday, as a matter of fact, going to be hosting its fourth convening. We're about to go into the fourth year of our work uh, and we're beginning to see a difference being made. And it's because of partnerships with folks like 100 Black Men and others. Uh, we've not tried to do this alone, but rather we've tried to create platforms and we are thankful for partners who come along to support the work we've been doing. Thank you so much. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas Cullins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.